and welcome to First Look, a Bible study looking ahead to the reading or readings for the coming Sunday. My name is Carl and it's really good to have you with us. This week we're continuing our journey through Luke's Gospel as we explore some of Jesus' teaching about the urgency of being ready to greet the incoming Kingdom of God. Before we get started on that, however, if you've not done so already, you may find it useful to download the sheet that accompanies this study. And you can find the link for that in the video description in YouTube. On the sheet, you will find the text of today's reading, some other passages you may wish to look up, the questions we'll be considering together later on, and lots of room for you to record your own thoughts and observations. And so then, without further ado, let's dive into today's passage, which comes from Luke's Gospel, chapter 12, verses 32 through to 40. Jesus was on the road from Galilee to Jerusalem, having set his face to go there. And... This section of Luke's Gospel is known as the travel narrative. It runs from chapter 9, verse 51, all the way through to chapter 19, verse 27, and contains a lot of Jesus' teaching, and in particular, many of Jesus' parables. Jesus was teaching his disciples, with crowds pressing in around him in the thousands, when a man had interrupted him and asked a question about inheritance. He wanted Jesus to solve a family dispute in his favour. That launched Jesus into a section of teaching all about money. It was a threefold section and it began in verses 14 to 21 with the parable of the rich fool, moved in verses 22 to 31 to reflect on material needs and our tendency to worry, and then finally it calls us to be unafraid and generous and to store up treasures in heaven in verses 32 to 34. This reading for today includes the latter part of that section about generosity and moves on to talk about being alert and ready for the coming of God's kingdom. So in this passage, we have Jesus, who was proclaiming the kingdom of God with real urgency as he made his final journey to Jerusalem. The people he met would not get another chance to hear the message. We have the disciples, including but not limited to the 12, Jesus' closest friends. And we know that from verse 22, Jesus was particularly addressing the disciples. And we also have these mass crowds, including thousands of people, packing in around Jesus to the point where we're told it was dangerous. It likely included in this crowd some of the Pharisees who were hostile to Jesus, who we heard about in earlier studies. And it's fascinating that if we read just one verse beyond today's text to verse 41, we find Peter struggling so much with what Jesus is saying that he asks, well, is this teaching for us as disciples or is it for the crowds more generally? It's quite a telling comment to make. Now, we know that Luke's Gospel was the third of the four canonical Gospels to be written around 80 to 85 of the Common Era. And there's material that Luke has in common with the Gospel of Mark. Maybe that Luke had a, a access to a copy of Mark. And also some shared material called Q, the source, um, that Luke likely shared with Matthew. But there's also a fair bit of material that's unique to Luke's Gospel, and some of that kicks around in today's passage. There are some at least partial parallels with some of the things we find in today's reading. So, for example, if we turn to Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 21, we get a partial parallel to what we find in verses 33 and 34 of today's text. And if we turn to Matthew 24, verses 43 to 44, we find a parallel, again, to what we see in today's reading in verses 39 to 40. 
So having encouraged his disciples to put their trust in him and not to worry about earthly concerns, what they would wear and what they would eat, Jesus then turned to talking to his disciples about being willing to give away all that they have and the need to be ready for his return. And there's a kind of edginess in particular about verses 39 and 40, which emphasises the urgency of what Jesus is saying here to his friends. Now, the first part of verse 32 contains a very familiar refrain, do not be afraid. This encouragement to not be afraid very often comes in Luke's Gospel and indeed the book of Acts with which it's paired uh, before a description of a mighty act of God. So there's something kind of preparatory, I think, about that formula, do not be afraid. And the language about a little flock reflects Jesus' being the good shepherd, that kind of imagery. So you might think of Psalm 23 and God walking with us all of our lives. And we might think of Jesus calling himself the good shepherd quite specifically in John chapter 10. We're told as we read on in verse 32 that it is God's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. In other words, it is God's intention, it's God's plan and indeed it's God's delight to do so. And doing so thus enables them to hold fast against those temptations that Jesus has been talking about, to resist the temptation to succumb to accumulating as much wealth as possible and instead to seek God's reign. And I think it's this promise that God um, not only wants but desires and, and longs even to, to give the disciples the kingdom which underpins all the more difficult things that Jesus goes on to say. Now in verse 33, the first part of that, Jesus talks about alms giving, giving alms, being charitable, using monies um, obtained by selling possessions. It points to the generosity that we are called to display. We're not to hoard lots of things that we don't really need to ourselves or splash out on lots of amazing experiences, but um, not use any of our um, resources to help others. Now, Jesus makes the contrast between the farmer in the parable of the rich fool from verse 19 of chapter 12, who bases his whole life upon his wealth and all that he can hoard away. And he compares that at the end of verse 33 to the unfailing treasures in heaven that we can obtain if we are generous. Now, this is a future, talking about treasures in heaven, that can be secured only by God. And I think that's really significant because so much of what Jesus has been talking about in the run up to this, don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to wear, etc., focuses our anxieties. And I suspect sometimes we hoard things away because we're anxious, we're fearful about the future. What Jesus is pointing to here, therefore, in verses 32 and 33, where he talks about treasures being stored up in heaven and about God's good pleasure to give us the kingdom, kind of goes a long way, I think, to allay some of those anxieties and helps us perhaps to, to refocus on what's especially important. The famous saying in verse 34, for where our treasure is, there our hearts will be also, tells us, I think, that what we really value, what we take to heart, as it were, reveals a lot about our character, it reveals who we really are. The promise that God has made to us in verse 32 creates some expectation, I think, and it reminds us that what God is ultimately offering us here is the gift of relationship. If our hearts are truly set on God, on storing treasures up in heaven, then we can have that fullness of life, that fullness of relationship, rather than the anxiety about um, earthly goods and possessions and wealth that we can't take with us after all, as the parable of the rich fool has already reminded us in this chapter. So that brings to a conclusion this little segment of teaching about wealth.
that as they covered verses 14 through to the end of verse 34. And now Jesus moves into talking about preparedness for the coming of the kingdom of God, alertness and readiness. And he does it in two parables, one in verses 35 to 38, and then the final short one in verses 39 and 40. The feel of this section may remind us somewhat of Advent, in that its focus is very much on getting ourselves ready, being prepared for God's coming into the world. In this case, looking ahead to the fulfilment of all things, when the kingdom comes in all of its fullness and God renews the heavens and the earth. And the readiness that it talks about here is the readiness to seize the opportunity to proclaim and spread good news when God calls us into action. So starting with the first parable in verses 35 to 38, the imagery is very much that of active preparation instead of just passively waiting around and letting things happen to us. And the context albeit perhaps a difficult set of language and context for us to grapple with today, is in, in relation to a master's return and the slaves, the servants, getting ready to um, deal with that. The master coming back from a wedding banquet, from a celebration. And it's interesting that Jesus talks about the heavenly banquet, the banquet of, of the kingdom. So there's that kingdom symbolism in the master's coming an identification of him perhaps with Jesus. Now the servants in this parable are called to be diligent, to be dressed for action, as it puts it at the beginning of verse 35, and to have the lamps ready so that when the master knocks, they can be there and present and able to lead him back into the house, even as verse 38 suggests, at a really late hour. So that gives us a sense of what's going on here. But verse 37 is the really radical bit. So it's not just about the servants being dressed for action and having their lamps ready so that when the master returns from the wedding banquet, even at a late hour, they can let him in and all will be well. Verse 37 shows us that there's more to it. There's the upside down nature of the kingdom of God coming out here. As the master serves diaconio, the servants. And this fits very much with Jesus's words about coming among his disciples as one who serves, as we see in chapter 22, verse 27, and the kind of new relationships that are made possible in the kingdom of God. So yes, there's a readiness and alertness that we need to have though, as we await the return of the master, the inbreaking of the kingdom, the wedding banquet, but there's also the upside downness of that kingdom. And it reminds us again about God, it being God's good pleasure to gift us that kingdom, something of what it means. So that's quite pleasant, really, you might say. But verses 39 to 40 add something of an edge to chapter 12. There's an image here which is rather more dramatic than a master returning from a wedding banquet. We're talking about a thief breaking into a house at an unexpected hour. Jesus is not setting out in this reading to kind of calm every fear and, and soothe every thought that we may have. And therefore, if we seek a kind of false security that sort of says, well, every little thing's going to be all right, so we don't need to worry, we can just sit back then we're not going to find that sort of security here. That's not what Jesus is promising. This is an active participation, a getting ready, being prepared, not a passive idling around, waiting for something to be done to us. And in verse 40, Jesus uses his favourite title for himself, the Son of Man. And that comes from Daniel chapter 7 and the imagery of uh, the Messiah coming on the clouds from heaven um, in order to vindicate the suffering people of Israel. So there's very much a sense here of eschatological judgment going on in this passage. And indeed, next week, when we come to look at Luke 12, verses 49 to 56, 
will be thinking more about this theme of judgment. But for now, there are real questions about embracing the promise that God gives us and what that means, about what it is to live generously in a world of scarce resources, about what it means to really be alert and prepared for the master coming in the night he longs to serve us, and indeed um, to heed Jesus' warning about the thief in the night. We'll be thinking about these things as we now turn to our questions for this week. Thank you.